Hey, well, welcome to the webinar. My name is Dr. Owen Wiseman. I am the medical advisor to A. Vogel, and I am the one that will be presenting uh, tonight's information as well. So if you have joined in already, we're really excited to have you. We can see more people popping in, which is absolutely fantastic. I think we're going to have some really good questions as well. But tonight's really about trying to support our children's health as we go into a really, really odd season where we've kind of had a little bit of influenza. We've kind of talked about um, RSV. We've heard a lot about respiratory and sidial virus. And then now we also have the new COVID variant that we need to deal with as well, the ARIS variant. So what we want to talk about is how do we actually stock our medicine cabinet to support all of the family members? We are talking a lot about children today, but we really want to focus on all family members. And in terms of what we're talking about tonight, we're going to be discussing what the relationship between the immune system and nutrition is. We're going to talk about what is our gut telling us, some sleep routines and stress management tips, because it's not just the younger kids that some of us have at home. We've got our teens as well, and they are dealing with a lot, including the different exams, the different midterm reports. So we really want to help them feel uh, settled as well. And then we're also going to be talking about tackling bumps, bruises, and growing pains, and then lice prevention. We don't often hear about ways that we can actually mitigate lice, but tonight we want to have that conversation as well. So let's dive into the first topic, which is the relationship between the immune system and nutrition. Now, this in part really looks at what is the role of the gut microbiome? How does it interact with our body and how does it help us feel the best that we can feel? Now, now, this is a really, really nice graph that I've always really enjoyed. So when we consume protein, for instance, part of those proteins, they get turned into different things. And those are amino acids such as L-glutamine, which many of us take for gut health, L-tyrosine, L-dopa. There's a couple of other ones in there, methionine. So all of these amino acids, we can see L-tryptophan up towards the top right. The gut bacteria influence their production. But then it's not just the L-tryptophan over here. You can see that the gut bacteria are also influencing the creation of GABA. But in order to actually convert a lot of these amino acids, we need good nutrition and we need good um, immune health as well to protect our gut and allow us to absorb those nutrients. So zinc, B1, B6 are responsible for converting proteins, helping out with stomach acid, and our folate, our iron, our B3. We can see there's all these... Uh, nutrients that play a big role into those conversion pathways to actually generate things like serotonin, our happy hormone, or to generate melatonin, to generate our calming neurotransmitter GABA. So it's really important that we're helping all family members actually consume the food that they need to consume in order to make all of these conversion pathways work. But sometimes our diets do not provide that, and we do need a little bit of support. Now, when we think about how often are people getting sick, you know, adults are about two to four per year, but kids can be sick up to 10 times per year. And that is where patient zero comes into play. And that is the person otherwise known as the toddler. So they've got a little more of a limited immune memory. We're going to talk briefly about the hygiene hypothesis. They are in close contact with others. And in many households, especially as we're talking about those with young children, that term patient zero takes on a really unique significance because often when an infectious illness makes its way into a family, it's actually the young child who unknowingly assumes that role. So the implications it holds for family health, we got to think that those kids are the ones who are at preschools and daycares, which are often almost a little bit like breeding grounds, right? We have all the kids that are interacting, they're playing with the same toys, they're wiping boogers on each other, and then they're going to go home and they're going to play with their siblings or play with their parents and caregivers. So that closeness is going to create ample opportunities for the transmission of all of these different infections. So a couple of the ways, if a child is showing signs of illness, you can consider isolating them from other family members until they recover to prevent further transmission. That doesn't mean locking them in a cold, dark basement until they're better and emerge like some creature from the Black Lagoon. Nevertheless, it does mean that setting them up in the middle of the living room is a terrible idea. 
So understanding this really allows families to take proactive steps to protect their loved ones and maintain a healthy living environment. So we want to wipe down toys after playing with them. We want to model good hand-washing behavior and other public health behaviors. Keep them home from school when they are infected, but sometimes kids don't show symptoms for a couple of days. So it's really important that if your intuition is telling you, oh, you know, I, I just don't think they're feeling the best, you should probably get, trust your gut instinct and you can start to do some preventative care as well to help them feel the best that they can feel. Now, we want to get them moving as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but Movement as medicine is a really, really powerful thought process, and it's a really powerful way to actually help them feel good and protect themselves always. So when you get them moving, it's going to boost the immune system. It's going to positively influence a number of different immune cells. And we know that sedentary lifestyles, where we're sitting down, we're not moving too much, there's, there's an association with something called inflammaging. That's where our body is so inflamed that it actually causes our biological age to become far higher than our actual chronological age. So if you're currently on the call and maybe you're in uh, your early 40s, let's say you're 42, if your body is underneath uh, or undergoing chronic inflammation, your biological age could be closer to 48, 49. 50. So that plays a large role in your bone health, your heart health, even your cognitive health and your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And we talked a little bit about the hygiene hypothesis earlier. And are we living in an environment that is too clean? We hear about this hygiene hypothesis, I would, I would comfortably say quite a bit. And living in a sterile area may not allow the immune system to develop. And we really, really want to focus on a healthy development. So let the kids play in the dirt, let them eat dirt. You know, it's a really good way to get them exposed to all of these different pathogens, all of these different bacteria and viruses so that they can actually mount a good immune response. But it's not just eating dirt or playing in the dirt. Immunity is what you eat. And when we look at the different nutrients, we already saw how they influence the establishment of different neurotransmitters and how they convert those pathways. But there's other ones that are important, like making sure you're getting vitamin D, getting some zinc. We've seen that zinc actually reduces your risk of pneumonia and infection. It's going to combat inflammation and oxidative stress. We want to make sure we have enough iron, iron you need to help immune cells multiply and mature. And we've seen that selenium, very important for thyroid health, enhances immune function and has a direct antiviral activity. So finding foods like Brazil nuts are very, very um, concentrated with selenium. This is a great way to add some of that into your diet is looking up those foods that are really, really rich in these nutrients or working with someone like a licensed naturopathic doctor or a dietitian, a holistic nutritionist to figure out what foods are going to be best for you. Because really immunity um, and, and good nutrition, that's the invisible parent to help support them, right? There are products like Biostrath Junior that can be a really good option to add into their day-to-day -day routine because it's easy to add to smoothies. You can drizzle it on uh, yogurt or oatmeal. There's really easy ways to super boost their food. And we've talked already a little bit about the relationship between the immune system and nutrition, but when do we escalate it? So one of the important things is if they're ever talking about shortness of breath, if they ever have a really persistent sore throat um, without a runny or a stuffy nose, because we don't really want them to have any of that going on. The other big one is no improvement within seven days. And that is a bit of a tell. We want to get them in because at the end of the day, why haven't they improved? Kids should bounce back pretty quickly, but if they're not showing any signs of improvement, it is time to escalate their care. The big one too is if they ever complain about trouble swallowing, that could be a very significant medical emergency and we really want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and helping to protect them. And one of the ways that we can do that is with different um, immune supporting products. So we're going to talk about how do we actually keep cold and flu at bay. And one thing that a vocal is very, very proud of is um, our fresh plant production as well. So all of our plants come from um, freshly harvested 
uh, plants outside of our, our facility. And I had a chance to visit Switzerland and see the facility in July. And it was just amazing. This is one of our farmers bringing freshly harvested echinacea into our facility. That is our tincture being bottled in our labs. And one thing that blew my mind when I was over there, it's actually considered our cold and flu products are actually considered a pharmaceutical over in Switzerland. So they are actually covered by the public health insurance. So doctors and pharmacists can prescribe our cold and flu products to help protect the general population. So you can really see that it just sets that product aside um, quite dramatically in protecting your children and protecting the other uh, members of your family. Now, one of the big things we want to look at is what does that data mean? We've got quite a few clinical trials on echinophores, about 35 right now. And a couple are, are currently underway over in, uh, in the European Union. And one thing that that data has shown us is that we are currently um, one of the only echinacea products on the entire market that can be taken by pregnant and nursing individuals. And that is really, really uh, speaking to the safety of the product. When we think about who is at home oftentimes with, with the children, you know, we'd love to say it is getting more equal, but often it is the, the wives and the mothers that are at home with the children. So we really want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves, especially if mom is still breastfeeding or if the caregiver or guardian is still breastfeeding as well, because we really want to make sure that we're protecting our health and we are not passing along that infection to the little one. The thing I really like about the Vogel stuff as well is that it is safe for both prevention and treatment. So a lot of the time we get asked, well, I'm sick right now and I'm at home and I don't want to go outside. I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to go outside either. But the nice thing is if you already have the regular strength product at home and you don't have the extra strength, just take a couple of the regular strength and that will make the difference. Because not all echinaceas are the same. So as I mentioned earlier, when I showed those pictures from Switzerland, we are currently um, one of the only fresh extracts as well. So that freshness at a study at the University of British Columbia actually showed that fresh echinacea was 10 times more potent than dried. I mean, I usually uh, compare this to if you're at home and you're making a stew, you know, there is a bit of a difference if you go and choose that dried basil that you then sprinkle into your stew. It's good, but there's nothing like going and picking some fresh basil or rosemary or thyme from your herb garden and then throwing that into a stew. And the, the difference in the smell is uh, almost gets my mouth watering, to be honest. There's nothing like a simmering basil leaf on top of a pot of stew that you're going to share with friends and family. It's so much more potent. So this is no different. If we have fresh extract and fresh plants, it is far, far more potent. That's why you want it, because we don't want to lose any of that antiviral activity. And for many of us, we're also using oil of oregano to help support our immunity. And echinophores has actually gone head to head with oil of oregano against H1N1, a strain of influenza that many of us are familiar with. And in that study, echinophores completely shut down H1N1, but the oil of oregano was not shown to be effective. Now, it doesn't mean it wasn't effective at all, but it just didn't seem to be effective against that strain of influenza. So if you're already taking oil of oregano, it's always a good idea to add in something else. So you have a couple of different options and a couple of different mechanisms of action. Now, we're going to give you some tips as well about how you can actually utilize some of the Echinophores products to support your little ones. But I really like the Echinophores Junior because they are chewable and they're sugar-free with this really good orange flavor. And I will, will say I'm actually quite prone to using these ones because they kind of taste a little bit like a candy, but you don't feel guilty because it's a, supporting the immune system and they're sugar-free. Now, what you'll see on the packaging is it will often say two plus. That doesn't mean it is not safe for under two. The reason being, remember, echinophores is safe for pregnant and nursing individuals. And that 
person could be nursing well into 15 months, 16 months, two years, two and a half years. The two plus is a choking hazard. We don't want to give our little ones this tablet and then it gets caught in their throat. So you can always crush it up and you can add it to their applesauce. You can add it to their, their yogurt, whatever they're taking in the morning. And one beautiful thing is our new Health Canada claim. It's clinically shown to help prevent and relieve symptoms of viral respiratory tract infections, such as the common cold and flu. When you turn over different echinacea products at the, at the store at Healthy Planet, you'll see it'll say on the side of some of the echinaceas traditionally used in herbal medicine to do X, Y, and Z. Ours is the only one with that clinical research on it. So what you'll see is ours has clinically shown or clinically proven. So it really is a totally different echinacea. Remember what I said earlier, over in Switzerland, our Echinophores products are actually covered by the public health insurance because they are considered pharmaceutical grade and they have so much clinical data on them. When I was over there, I actually went into a pharmacy and the Echinophores or Echinomed as the, the uh, medicine and grade is called, is behind the counter, kind of like when you go to a pharmacist, it is behind the counter. So we got to get crafty. We got to think of ways that we can sneak it into our little one's uh, day-to-day routine. I really like making these popsicles for the, the young sick ones in my life. It's a little bit of our hot drink, some raw honey. I really like using our local uh, beekeeper's honey. I find it really, really good. There's a raspberry and a blueberry honey that their bees produce. And I really, really, really like both, a little bit of both in uh, in the popsicles. The ginger's a hit and miss. I've done this uh, once with some of the, the little ones in my life, and the ginger did not go over the way I thought it would, but I personally really like that still. And then sometimes we don't always love a hot drink, so you can make ice cubes ahead of time, and that way you can add it to some hot water. It'll cool it down and make it far more drinkable for sensitive little little throats. Now we've talked a lot about immunity and nutrition and how to how to sneak some good um, gut health into into our kids' lives and how to sneak some good immunity into our kids' lives. But as we get older, you know, those coloring pages that are getting graded at school, suddenly those become these big beasts of exams and we're in exam season. And that is very stressful. So how do we help our teens especially maintain their mood and their mental health around that time? Because exam stress is coming from everywhere. There's pressure to get good marks. There's parental expectations. These students, the teens, our kids are comparing themselves with others. There's a competitiveness. Oh, what grade did you get? So they're worried, right, about being rejected, about being ridiculed, about being left out. So one thing I always encourage even my parents, my patients to um, reflect on is how much pressure are you putting on your, your teen as well to just get the highest mark possibly at the expense of their own good health, whether that's their physical health or their mental health. We really want to reflect on how much are we contributing to that stress that our teens are experiencing. Now, one thing I really, really enjoy myself doing is oftentimes when I'm working, sometimes even when I'm giving a presentation, I don't have it running right now, but I absolutely love throwing on some sounds of nature. So I often have hikes uh, going on in the background where people are walking through forests or meadows, and you can hear all the bees buzzing and the, the calls of the different birds. And one thing that's pretty amazing is sounds of nature such as bird songs and moving water, cause a 37% faster recovery from stress. And they help with our brain health and our mental health. So um, if you are ever sitting there and you're working and you're feeling a little bit tired, I definitely encourage you throw on that, uh, that nature sound in the background. You will thank yourself. The other big thing is earlier I said, you know, get your kids in the dirt, let them explore, let them go outside and run around in the grass and get dirty and get messy. You know, it's just clothes, but you can clean them. And there's really good research coming out that when you get kids into nature related activities, their gut microbiome, right, exposing children to a higher bacterial load in the natural environment by encouraging them to play outside is a reasonable way to increase the diversity of their intestinal microbiome. We really want them to have good gut health. 
So get them out in the dirt and the forest and the beach and the, the sand and just let them be kids. And one thing that's really neat is serotonin, which is our happy hormone. We've actually shown in this trial that when uh, preschool children play outside, the happy hormone in their feces, which is one of the excretion pathways for serotonin, is much, much higher than the kids who are playing indoors. So it's really um, exciting if we can model that behavior and get them excited about the great outdoors. There's lots of really neat apps that are almost like uh, Shazam for bird sound. So you can hold up your phone and it'll listen to all the birds and it'll tell you what bird call is nearby. But the other big thing we need to cheese. Uh, um, the other big thing we need to consider is getting them sleeping well. So what's their sleep routine? And I just I absolutely love this picture because it is something that when we're living in some of the big cities like Toronto or Ottawa or Vancouver, we don't often get to look up at the sky and see something like this. But it is just amazing that you can go to places in the world where light pollution hasn't taken out our stars. And it's like this. And it's it's awe inspiring, to be honest. And that's where our sleep hygiene comes into play. We really want to make sure that we have a nice dark room. And that means that those really pretty aesthetic uh, sheer curtains, they may not always be the best for our health. We want them to have a good relaxing routine. I always love doing a sleep routine. So if we're ever babysitting, you can get the kids um, do a little massage. I really like doing some of the lavender oil and you can rub it onto their temples really gently and get them excited. You know, it's nice to go to bed. It's fun to go to bed. And the more that they can participate in that routine, the better. We really want to make sure that we're we're trying to get people asleep at the same time as well. That's a really big one. And try and get the devices off. In our own household, we really practice um, trying to charge our devices in another room. Or as soon as you get to bed, you put them down and you put them away. And that's your time where, you know, perhaps your, your spouse, if you're um, living with a partner, you and your spouse have some time to just be the two of you and, and chat. Because... At night, we're just we're a little more vulnerable, right, to things like cyberbullying. We're alone in our rooms, especially our teens. We're on our devices, and that's where cyberbullying can happen. So, if you can get them into the routine of putting their devices away before bed, maybe they won't be so at risk of that cyberbullying. And when they come to you and go, you know what, uh, mom or dad or guardian, aunt, uncle, grandma, whoever, when they're vulnerable with you doesn't matter if it's true or not in the more in the moment they're opening up to you so our role as caretakers as parents is just believe them in the moment you know you can work out the details later but they really just want you to be there and they want your love and that's where don't forget to model healthy behaviors yourself right we, we want our our kids especially when they're younger they pick up on every mannerism we do we all remember probably the first time we swore in front of our, our little one and suddenly they start repeating it and you're going oh no no don't let don't let your other caregiver hear that uh and you're trying to panic and reverse it but it doesn't always work and they hold on to that word now, one of the other things that might be waking our little ones up at night is growing pains, right? The bones and the muscles are elongating, especially our femur, our fibula, our tibia in the lower body. So plenty of cuddles. You can do a heat pack on their lower limbs or wherever they're, they're telling you there's pain. And you can do some massage as well with some pain relieving essential oils. Now, it's not just the teens who are experiencing higher levels of stress. We talked about the exam stress a little bit. Kindergarten, they actually did a study of almost a million kindergarten kids, and about 25,000 showed signs of anxious behavior. And I'm really happy because you hear that and you think, oh, okay, the kid's occasionally anxious. But the author said it's not just this occasional shyness or this occasional crying. It's got to be something that teachers saw happening consistently. And that's where we can consider something like the passion flower or the relax spray. The thing I really like about the passion flower is that it's actually um, for as young as four years old, and it's an anti-stress product, kind of that anti-anxiety uh, product as well. And so it's going to help combat that nervousness and that stress that some of our little ones feel in, again, as young as four, which is really, really nice for that. And that they can take every single day. 
But let's say they need something a little more portable to help support them. That's where the Relax Spray comes into place. This was Canada's first botanical anti-stress spray. I really love the portability of it because if you do have your teens, if you have someone going to present something at school, you put this in their bag. It's passion flower and lemon balm, which are anti-stress, and then a little bit of zinc as well to help calm that the stress because zinc actually stops the over secretion of the stress hormone known as cortisol. But when you're young, you're running around, you're playing sports, you're playing extracurriculars, you're you're playing tag with your friends and you're tackling them. And one of the big things is we know that kids who are really active, especially in extracurriculars, they are at a higher risk of injuring themselves. So medical care for injuries are often due to overuse um, injuries in kids who are under 14. And most of them are occurring during practice. And in terms of the most common things by age, we look at cuts and punctures, and, and then we get to around 10 where there's more high hitting sports, and that those are the fractures. And then 15 to 17, we're looking at head injuries and concussion care. And remember, a kid's skull can fracture at an impact of only seven kilometers an hour. And when they're sprinting down the field chasing that, that soccer ball, I mean, it's not uncommon for them to be doing speeds like that. So they are at risk of injuries. So we really want to remember, what am I doing for their injury? We want to rest. We want to stop and take a break from that activity. That might mean pulling them off for the rest of the game to really help support their head. We want to ice the area. We may want to compress it if it's going to start swelling really, really quickly just to keep the swelling down. And then you do want to elevate it because you do want to minimize how much blood flow is going to the area to keep that swelling down. Otherwise, once it's super swollen, it is quite difficult to bring that swelling down in a, in a reasonable amount of time. They should be warming up, you know, as, as any kid who is in a, a sports, they often do a little bit of warm up, whether that's just running around the field or maybe that's um, rotating the ankles and the wrists to get ready to play. And then staying hydrated. That's a big one. When they run over to the side of the field and they're huffing and puffing, we want to make sure we have some good hydration ready for them. That may even include um, some natural electrolytes as well. And I actually had um, someone suggest to me that for those immune uh, popsicles, you could actually use instead of some orange juice, use coconut water because it has some natural electrolytes. I have not tried that, but it is definitely on my list of things to do. Now, what about if you've tried all that and they're still hurting? That's where something like the Arnica gel can be really, really useful. Remember earlier when I said, remember that Echinophores is considered a pharmaceutical over in Switzerland and covered by the public health insurance? Absolute Arnica is also covered by their public health insurance. It is a pharmaceutical grade anti-inflammatory topical gel, and it's gone head to head with a 5% ibuprofen gel in the treatment of hand osteoarthritis in a randomized double blind study. And so that's a really, really good thing to keep in their soccer bag, in their hockey bag, in their um, gymnastics bag, whatever, because we know that there's really powerful anti-inflammatory compounds found in Arnica gel, this beautiful golden uh, plant that we, we grow over in Switzerland. And one thing that I really like about our Arnica gel is when you squeeze it out of the tube, it's got this really impressive golden color. And I cannot recall off the top of my head, but they told us it was something like 16 to 21 flower heads goes into every single tube of the Arnica gel. So you're getting a really, really high concentration. And it has also been studied in osteoarthritis of the knee. And people reported some pretty significant improvements over a couple of weeks of using that as well. Now, last but not least, I really wanted to mention, what do we do about lice? Lice is, uh, lice is a crazy thing that can spread through a classroom like a wildfire. We saw how quickly the wildfire spread this year alone. And this was a bit of a distressing study from 2014 that actually showed a super lice had emerged that was resistant to a lot of the common anti-lice shampoos and ointments. And the scientists in this study, which only came out a couple of years ago, discovered that the super lice variant was responsible for about 97% of Canadian-based cases of head lice and almost 99.6% of US-based cases. And 
Lice can be present on the scalp for weeks before they are discovered. Less than 50% of people actually scratch their scalp when they have head lice. And as a child that's often in the classroom for days or weeks before the head lice is detected, there's honestly not a huge benefit to sending them home early because if they've spread it, they've already spread it. And head lice often get frequently overdiagnosed, which leads to the overuse of different chemical head lice products. And we know that those products are hazardous to a child's health and can further contribute to resistance. So what is the impact, right? If we get these super lice bugs, they're harder to treat. They're going to spread more easily between classmates and siblings. And one thing that worries me is we often hear online that head lice infections mean poor hygiene, but that is not the case and it leads to a lot of stigmatization and bullying. Hygiene is not a factor. The cleanest kid, right, can still get head lice. It doesn't matter how clean you are. So you really want to build your toolkit. Some people will actually use DEET, that really strong chemical we use to ward off mosquitoes sometimes when people go camping. And DEET actually came second to tea tree oil in repelling the louse of the, um, of the lice. So one way that you can kind of work it out is make your own hair mask. You can use about two teaspoons of the tea tree essential oil, one teaspoon of the rosemary essential oil, two drops of lemon juice, a little acidic. You can actually use two to three tablespoons of our Molcasen product. That's our liquid prebiotic, our gut health product. Now you might be thinking, wait, liquid prebiotic, those are for the inside of our body. You would not be wrong, but it is really, really high in lactic acid. And what's really interesting is one thing that happens with the skin barrier is as the skin barrier loses its acidity, it becomes more prone to a number of different infections, opportunistic infections, staph infections. So one thing that you're doing is using the mulcason, you're actually keeping the skin barrier a little more acidic like it naturally is. And that's going to help to kill some of the eggs and some of the louse that are potentially on the scalp. And then you're getting that tea tree killing effect and the rosemary is very stimulating for the scalp. So it'll help to bring a lot of that good blood flow up to the area. So mix it all, apply it on the hair, leave it on for about 15 minutes. That's probably going to make more than you need for one application, depending on how short the, the child's hair is. And really make sure when you're washing it out, please, please, please protect their eyes because again there's lemon juice in there you've got the essential oils tea tree is pretty strong itself so make sure they're keeping their eyes scrunched up really really tight and you know maybe it's something that they don't they're not quite comfortable doing it themselves so maybe it's something that you do with them and that's a really good bonding exercise between you and uh, and the little one as well so I really, I wanted to thank all of you. Um, we had a pretty good turnout and I just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time out of your evening. I know there are a million things that you could have chose to do. You could have been binged watch the next episode of your show, but you chose to be here tonight. So one thing I'm going to do is go over to the chat box and the Q and A, and I'm going to answer some of the questions. And if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask, and I will get to all of them as we go through. So we currently use the Suro Kids. Can the Junior Burt version be used in conjunction or is it better on its own? Hmm. Suro Kids. You could, could you could definitely combine the two of them. Um, so the Echinoforce Junior with the Suro Kids as well. Yeah, I absolutely, I'm a huge fan of use up what you've got at home, right? It doesn't mean you have to go out to, uh, you know, uh, the nearest healthy plant and spend $300 and buy all of this product, you can use up what you have at home and then Healthy Planet's there uh, when you need to go stock up. So you can definitely use that um, as well. How to keep newborns from getting sick? Oh, that is a, that's a tough one, right? Newborns are sick a lot. Um, they're sick a lot because their immune system is still developing. So one of the big things that we have to consider with newborns is they haven't really been super exposed to a lot, especially if it was a C-section birth relative to a, a vaginal delivery as well. We lose out on some of that innate immune and that exposure um, with the C-section. That's not to say C-section is bad. It saves lives. But that exposure, you know, there are differences. So when it comes to helping newborns from getting sick, that's why I always encourage anyone who's breastfeeding, take the echinoforce. 
you need to be taking the Akinophores. We know it's safe for pregnant nursing. And if you can um, boost or not boost, I can't, I have to avoid that word. If we can help support your immune system overall, then when you're breastfeeding, you're passing some of that natural protection through the breast milk and you're helping that newborn from getting sick. And I have a number of patients um, that are breastfeeding right now and I have them on a kinoforce and they have actually told me that their newborn gets sick far less frequently relative to their friend's babies. But it's natural for babies to get sick a little more frequently because it's their first time meeting a lot of these bacteria and these viruses outside the womb. So it is really important that they get that exposure. We just really want to know what are the key warning signs to make sure when is it warrant a visit to the walk-in clinic or the our family doctor as well. We need to escalate that care because one thing we want to keep in mind is antibiotics are good, but they kind of get handed out willy nilly without really thinking about the consequences. And there's been data, like especially out of the University of New Zealand and a couple of really prestigious universities that show the earlier a child is exposed to antibiotics, that's actually associated with depressive symptoms, uh, higher risk of ADHD, higher risk of impulsivity, uh, as late as kind of three and a half to 11 years old. So we want to be very diligent with deciding when do we want to give those um those stronger medications because it's not always first line treatment. For instance, the Canadian Pediatric Association, when you have a middle ear infection, the uh, first line treatments actually wait and watch for 72 hours, three days. And if the ear infection does not go away in three days, then you seek the next line treatment. But for three days, you're kind of sitting at home hoping for it to get better. And most times it does. How to keep safe when kids don't yet show signs of being ill another big one. It's preventative care, right? Preventative Prevention is the best cure. That's one of my favorite lines. We always seem to wait until we're feeling really, really uh, terrible to say the least. So with our new Health Canada claim, that's where I really like if you get the kids on something preventatively and with that orange flavor and sugar-free chewable, it's a really good way to get them on something preventative. With our product, you can take it every single day for four, at least four months. At the Echinaceas, you can only take them for about a week or two and you have to stop. But we have a clinical trial on our Echinoforce Junior. It was done in 203 children. They took it every single day for four months. No kids grew a third leg or a third eye or grew gills, although that would be super cool to develop some of those superpowers. So make sure the kids are just getting outdoors, um, playing around, trying new things, meeting new people, because it's a good way to expose them to different uh, pathogens and let their system develop some of that natural immunity. Um, is the echinophores to be used once symptoms show? So you can definitely use it preventatively. We have the largest human clinical trial on echinacea with 755 participants published in 2012. And yeah, they took it every single day for four months. And the group who took uh, the echinophores every single day had far fewer infections or secondary complications. And if they did end up getting sick, they did not have nearly as bad symptoms. And it they got better about a day and a half relative to the placebo group. So I I take it every single day, even right now I'm drinking the hot drink out of my mug. Um, so I take it every single day in some form or another and relative to my friends who, who don't really do anything for their health, I can say I get sick far less frequently. So prevention is always, always the best cure. Thoughts on elderberry? Yeah, I really, uh, I like the elderberry. I think there's a lot of really great options. Um, to me, it adds that antibacterial, antiviral, um, and anti-inflammatory a little bit. It's mostly antioxidant where that benefit's coming from, but it's a really good way to add in those aspects. I don't, I don't myself really love it on its own. I typically like it in conjunction with other things that you're doing. I don't find the research strong enough um, to date for it to really be something I would ever recommend to a patient on its own as a monotherapy. So just take that. It is something that I do, I do combine with other products, but you know what? It's really tasty and people like tasty things. So it's it's uh, it's not bad as long as you're really avoiding all that added sugar and, and um, that some of the products do put in. What and where is the orange flavor derived from? When we were over in Switzerland, I'm pretty sure it's the if memory serves, it's the orange uh, zest, if I'm not mistaken, from the peel. Um, don't quote me on that. I can't. Uh, I can't 100% remember what that 
what was said in that lecture, but I'm pretty sure that's where it's coming from. What are the risks of echinacea? Should certain adults avoid it? Yeah, so this big question comes down to typically the concern we have on autoimmunity, right? And autoimmune conditions like MS. And the trouble there is that the data is, it's kind of one of those things got, that got overblown. You know, we often hear like there was one case study where this interacted with a blood thinner and this isn't, I'm talk, not talking about echinacea right now. And then now there's a big caution about, well, don't take this because it interacts with blood thinner. Well, we don't know that. It actually only interacted with blood thinners in those two or three case reports. But in most of the clinical trials where people were on it, we don't see that. You know, that's one example where things tend to take on a life of their own, especially on the internet. We know about the, the TikTok trends, like the one that I just had some of my teen patients talking about was castor oil in the eye. Um, you know, there's just some interesting things that happen on the internet. Now, in our clinical data, what's really nice is on echinophores, we have 34 clinical trials on echinophores. And the big thing of that is we have 10 human clinical trials. In total, across those 10 human clinical trials, we have a total of about 2,300 participants. So we have a lot of statistical data that we can look through. In our clinical trials, we have not found that it increases risk of autoimmune flares in the least. So I should actually put the quote in these presentations, but there's a quote from one of our studies and the authors and the researchers say they didn't notice any heightened risk in the autoimmune population. So for me, that really speaks to, okay, this seems safe. And I've given it to my rheumatoid arthritis patients. I've given it to my patients with MS. And it's been really, really interesting to actually see how that interacts with their body. And most of them find that they're feeling really, really good with it. So there are risks, but this is why you talk to someone and why you always choose the most safe, most clinically validated option, because there's all that data that you can fall back on and you can read. And all of those studies are publicly available as well, right? Being a pharmaceutical over in Switzerland, being covered by public health insurance, you have to invest in research and development. And that research is um, gives us a lot of, of uh, comfort in the safety of the product. And sorry, I missed the beginning. What is your background? Yeah, so I, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm the medical advisor to a Vogel. I used to be a clinical researcher. I worked at our local uh, children's hospital. I had the pleasure of working in the neurology department, especially with kids with pediatric epilepsy for, for a number of years. And then I moved into gastroenterology because my mother was diagnosed with an inflammatory condition of the gut. And I was really, really interested in uh, learning a bit about how I could support her. And so one big thing that that led me to discover is, wow, everything everything starts to the gut or is related to the gut. So that's a bit of my background and how I got into naturopathic medicine. Is a kinophores good to take daily up to four months? How long a break should you have in between use periods? I will say myself that I have been taking it probably every single day since I started advising the company about six and a half years ago. And um, yeah, no weird feelings. And like I said, I tend to get sick far less often than friends and family. The clinical data on Akinafor supports its use every single day preventatively for four months. The inevitable question is what happens after four months? You can take a break for about a week or two, and then you can start back up on another four month period. It's something that I just, I know it makes a difference in me. And when I do get sick, I feel far um, less crappy than I expect to feel. And I think uh, those were some phenomenal questions so far. If anyone has any other questions, I'm going to leave the question box open for just a couple more minutes. Um, if you do have to jump off, don't hesitate. Um, you can always email me directly. My email is on the website as well. And uh, I want to respect your time if you've got other places to go, but we can just wait and see if some of the other questions come in. Hey, okay. I'm going to leave up that picture because that is such a pretty picture. <laughs> Hey, I think that's it for all of the questions. So again, everyone, thank you for taking the time out of your evening. Like I said, you had a million other choices that you could have gone to do instead of being here. So thank you for taking the time out of your evening. We really look forward to having you at the next Healthy Planet webinar. Um, and really thank you, Healthy Planet, for, for having us on and allowing me to speak to, to all of you. Um, I'm wishing you all protect yourselves. Be well as we go into this crazy cold and flu season and um, don't get sick because there are lots of ways you can help prevent it. 
eat good nutrition, lots of zinc, things like that. And we will see you at the next one. Wishing all of you good preventative health.